and it got out of control. Um, fast forward years and years and years, 20 years, um, 40 WIs, the last one, um, resulted in um, me flipping my car into a live gas main, shutting down part of the city. I ran because I knew I knew oh, I was fucked. Shit. Welcome back to the I Am Redemption podcast, and today I have a very special friend of mine who has made the journey down here to San Antonio and has graced us with his presence, Mr. Celebrity Chef Philip Spear. I, dude, you have so many accolades, I had to write it down on my phone. You've been, uh, you've gotten major recognition in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, GQ Magazine, Texas Monthly, Bon Appetit, and many more. Um, you've taken the chef thing to a, the highest of levels, it seems, but... Uh, Brother, me and you met a couple years ago um, in the running community, obviously, mm-hmm. and I, I didn't really even know who you, you who you were at that point, but uh, it's a special story I tell a lot of people. We were at a trail run, and I was standing around, and it was just me and a couple of my friends who were all who were all addicts, uh-huh. and uh, we were amongst the regular running community thinking we're outsiders, and you popped up right next to us and started chatting us up, uh-huh. and I remember asking you at one point, I was like, dude, how did you know? And you're like, we know our own. Yeah. And that was, that was always special to me. And then I would learn who you are and everything like that. And uh, just tremendous amount of uh, respect for everything that you've done, dude, especially mm-hmm. within the recovery and the running community and everything like that. So without further ado, Mr. Philip Spear, welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. First and foremost, express gratitude for, for being here and being able to connect with you um, again to c- continue our connection. That's, that's funny. Um, you bring up that trail run that morning. I had um, seen you and the group and multiple times on the town Le- town lake trail mm-hmm. in austin and always saw y'all running by i'm like eh, those are my people and then when i pulled up to that trail run on that sunday morning with this like west austin kind of yuppie middle-aged yeah. group that i had run with a couple times before and then i saw your crew start pouring out i'm like those are my people and i just walked right over and then just started yeah we just started talking and we we you and then others in the crew started speaking the whole time throughout the run and it was super fun and then mm. continued continued to, to grow the friendship but uh yeah that was that was fun and that's exactly how i feel like in these different communities that we go in and out of it's like you you gravitate you find you are connected to your own yes. and it's like it's magnetic right. you know i just uh i just spoke at something recently downtown austin and when i first walked in everybody's in there and they're they're shooting ties and everybody's like dressed very like you're saying yuppie and business-like and all that. And then all of a sudden I started seeing drug addicts come in and I'm like, right. my <laughs> people God. my people are here, I'm good. I even said it on stage. I was like, I was nervous around you all until I saw the addicts coming through the door and I was like, all right, we're in here, so I'm good. Yeah. But dude, where did your journey all begin? How, you know, it's been a wild journey for you to be here where you're at today, but where mm-hmm. did it all begin for you? Um, I mean, we can unpack for how far back do you want to go? I mean, but if, if, you know, introducing me as a chef, I can tell you that my career and my professional journey began um, in my teen years. Um, I have a couple stories I tell of my success. There's like the kind of more romantic story, which is mostly true. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's like the reality, which is also mostly true. And mm-hmm. it, it lies somewhere in the middle. It's all perspective. But, you know, being... Um, ninth grade educated only. Um, my options were limited in what I could do professionally. And I um, moved to Austin at 16 by myself or with a friend and began working in restaurants. Um, I began working in restaurants because that was really the only thing that would hire me at that point. Um, so when um, I began working in restaurants, I, I just I learned that I really loved it. Leading up to that point, though, the more romantic story is I had friends who were in the food business, friends of the family, and I always looked up to that profession and thought one day maybe I would enjoy doing a sh- being a chef, playing mm-hmm. a chef role. Um, and, and I did look at it that way because I look at most things as you're just playing a role, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, this whole game of life is just yeah. that, right? You're right. So I'm like, oh, I'll try that out. Well, I did, and I did out of necessity and then immediately found that I had a a very strong passion for it. And that passion actually elevated me to some success Mm -hmm. um, and hard work. But uh, during all of that, it was kind of that era 
of the pirate ship mentality. You're like in the kitchen and you're drinking and partying and it's a bunch of, it is a bunch of other people like me, yeah. other dropouts, other addicts, people, you know, ex-cons, rehab, whatever it may be. Um, at that time, in that in that time frame and leading up to that, but for me it was like the mid '90s, late '90s. That was that was the main bulk of the people who worked in the kitchen and restaurants. And so, that lifestyle, that being a skateboarder, being a, a kind of an uneducated punk ass mm -hmm. <laughs> running around Austin without much accountability, um, you know, that escalated quickly into pretty heavy alcohol and drug use. Um, really just it was accepted it was even accepted it was um it was sorry it was accepted it was even really expected right. that that was how you were going to behave so a lot of hanging out of bars a lot of um you know at first what seemed like kind of cool community building com camaraderie and then later on turned into to pretty heavy addiction um you know, retrospectively, I learned that that actually started many, many years before that. Right. But that is like that. That's how I see the story um, or how I saw it at, at first, especially when I first began trying to get sober. A um, lot of a lot of easy scapegoat there of like, this is how it was. This is what we did. Yeah. So start getting in trouble, you know, whatever that looks like. Bar fights, fights, fucking around, running around the, the city late at night, skateboarding, graffiti, uh, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, holding, holding. Bunch of tomfoolery going bunch on. Bunch of tomfoolery, holding, buying, selling, you know, a little bit of everything. Um, and, you know, after multiple run-ins and multiple DWIs, um, at the same time, I was also building a family. I had a, I had a daughter at 21. Um, I had another daughter 10 years later. Um, I um, was really focusing on my career, but still working in that. Uh, sorry, I was really working and focusing on my career, but still playing around too much with, with the drugs and alcohol. And then it became more than playing and it became something that I kind of needed to get through the stress and, and that part of my life and ended up turning to multiple DWIs. But I was still like gaining success in my career and I was still getting these accolades that you mentioned. And I was, I was but I was, I almost used it as like, well, I have to be this way in order to continue getting the success in my career yeah. i have this is what fuels me i work better this way clearly look look you know look, look at, at my look, look, what, at look at the results yeah exactly look at the results this is this is clearly working and it got out of control um fast forward years and years and years 20 years um 40 wi is the last one um resulted in um me flipping my car into a live gas main shutting down part of the city I ran because I knew I knew oh, I was fucked. Shit. I ran, um, didn't make it. Made it about three hundred yards. It was the like literal and proverbial f falling asleep in a ditch. I was found by a cameraman, a news a news crew cameraman. Um, I don't remember much of everything that was happening, but I do remember waking up and seeing the smirk on his face as he was filming me. Really? Uh, yeah, like he got something, and he did. It's, uh, it's, you can find it. No um, shit. Yeah. <laughs> we got to look that up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, there was, you know, I remember kind of walking back out with to, to the street and seeing my car upside down. Again, I had totaled four or five cars at that point. Like I said, multiple DWIs. That was the surface. That's you're, what it looked like. And you're, this is, we're talking drinking. It wasn't much drugs too or well that's what it looked like to the public this guy has a drinking problem it right. was much more than that okay um we can touch on that later if we want um but you know this is my story is that of heavy alcohol use right my that, that that's the story that people people know and see there was there was heavy drug use as well um that was hidden gotcha. um I, I think it was very well hidden. I'm finding out that it wasn't maybe as well hidden as I thought. thought. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but there were things that were that were pretty hidden. Um, however, walking out, seeing my flipped car, I knew it was all over. Um, I had uh, again; it was my fourth DWI. Went immediately to jail. I did a little jail time. Um, ended up in rehab. Um, still, I remember driving to rehab that day, being like, "Okay, I'm gonna do this. Probably quit drinking for a while." Um, Maybe I can drink again in the future. I can't drink again right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm going to get through these motions, get back to work. Always thinking get back to work. I remember on my way there, or my first uh, call out of out of jail was to, to people on my team in the restaurant, I need you to do this, I need you to do that, this is going to happen. 
my the company president called me he's like you don't you don't need to call anyone right now oh, <laughs> right and yeah. so my whole thought was like okay get back to get through you have mend these these things that that are currently just really torn apart and then i will get back to work and everything will be normal mm-hmm. um I was partnering with a company. Um, it was a. I had just opened my own concept within the company for my namesake. It was called Saint Philip. My, mm-hmm. name, my name is Philip, obviously, um, and uh, it's a very successful company. I'd helped it grow to multi units, and like I said, I had, I had earned partnership in that company, and it was my retirement plan. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, when I got out of rehab and was ready to go back to work, it was it was all over. There, there was no going back. Um, and they tried, but it just it didn't work. So. Effectively, that entire part of my life was done. All the accolades, I had all gotten it with that same company. I had been there you know, over 10 years. Um, the growth and, 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 and the recognition all kind of stemmed from that. I had had you know, a lot of experience leading up to that, which, which helped, but that was really where, where it all came from. And I thought that my entire life was done, and I didn't know what to do. Um, and I was almost 300 pounds at that point. No shit. Yeah, so I was over 100 pounds um, overweight. Um, I had a steady diet of fast food and Diet Coke. Um, smoked two packs of cigarettes a day. Was heavy drinking. Um, Coke and crack use was, was pretty normal. And um, I knew that everything had to change when I was in the rehab rehabilitation center. Um, it was a, a great place in Hunt, Texas called La Hacienda. Maybe mm-hmm. you've heard of it. Yep. And um, the MDs on site were like, look, you're, you have type 2 diabetes, you know, severe sleep apnea, high blood pressure. Like, you're not going to if, – if your children have children, you will not, you will not be a grandfather right. to them. You are on the path of a pretty quick death. So that hit me pretty hard. And immediately, I stopped everything. Um, immediately, I, I have not eaten fast food in nine oh, years. I have not had a soda in, nine, in over nine years. I have not had a drink or a puff of a cigarette in over nine years. I mean, even at, at, at our rehab where everyone hung out at the butt hut where yeah. they all smoked cigarettes, I avoided that. That's when I found running. There was a trail above the butt hut yep, yep, with yep. a little fitness trail, and I would just go up there and walk and walk and then run or then jog right. and then jog. That's how mine started too. And the run. walk, and then yep. I then I pick a spot and I'm like, all right, I'm gonna run from here mm-hmm. to there. And it was every time I wanted a cigarette, or every time the crew that I had connected with at rehab would go to smoke, I would go to the trail, and I just kept that up. And then when I got home um, and learned that I wasn't going back to work, uh, they did take care of me, so I had a little bit of space. Mm-hmm. And I, grateful and privileged for that yeah. and i understand that um I had a little space to figure myself out figure my shit out um my marriage ended uh, i was scared that i would lose um relationships and connections with my children uh, but i would have that space to, to start mending that start mending myself and then start my journey of sobriety um in rehab i did realize that i could no longer drink ever again right. going in thinking that i would do it again one day leaving knowing that that wasn't going to happen for you, when when you so when you you literally started your running journey just like I did in treatment uh-huh. is when I started doing mine too, and mine was only to lose weight. It yeah. wasn't because I loved running uh-huh. or I knew the benefits it had. I just wanted to lose a little bit of weight. Uh-huh. Um, is that what it was like for oh, you? No. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I had to do something different. It was also something. It was to separate myself from from what everyone else is doing that I didn't want to do. Right. Um, and yes, I. I knew at that point I needed to lose weight. Like I said, I, had, I was type two diabetes, over yeah. 100 pounds overweight. So I knew that was something. At least I would like go and try do a couple pull ups. It was so dumb. <laughs> <laughs> did uh did you eventually after you had started doing this a while, doing this a while, did you have people wanting to start joining in with you? Um, at yeah. Any point? Yeah, absolutely. At first, um, when I was kind of solo doing it by myself, I had friends who were also feeling unhealthy and had seen that I was making some lifestyle changes, wanting to join in and. We had, uh, there were some other addicts that I had met who had already found running, who mm-hmm. I would run with. A good friend of mine, Carlos Truan. Oh, yeah. I was just you know texting Carlos? with him yesterday. Okay. Carlos was, uh, was running a lot at Shout that point. Shout out, Carlos. Uh, for sure. Uh, Carlos was running a lot at that point. And um, I would go run with him. In fact, uh, I was just telling my wife the story of my first seven mile run with him. And uh, there was a third person with us. And she looks over at him. And she's like, Oh, you're a marathoner. I bet you're just getting warmed up. I was like, oh, you're just getting warmed up. Seven miles, and now I get that. Like, right. seven miles is when I'm just getting warmed right, up. Right, right, but right. Um, yeah, he's a uh, he's a huge huge part of my journey, actually. Carlos, yeah, very good friend and very big part of my journey. So, dude, my funny you said my first lift mm-hmm. in the gym ever 
was, it? was with Carlos. Wow. We we got in, we, uh-huh. I was going to Lifetime, but I would only touch cardio equipment. I wouldn't do anything with weights. And so I remember doing our first workout with him. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Please continue. So, Sorry to yeah, interrupt. Yeah, so he's, he was a big part of my running journey. So those are the kind of people I'd run with. Um, and uh, I had an opportunity to open another restaurant. Um, I told you I had I had partnership in this mm-hmm. company, and I, and I left that company. Fast forward a few years, that company sells for hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. My percentage, <laughs> it's gone. Uh, <laughs> um, just a little, little interesting part of that story. Um, yeah, I had an opportunity to open another hold on, restaurant. Hold on, hold on, let's not go, let's not glaze over that. What did it? What does it feel like to realize that that company, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, uh, and that opportunity's gone? Take, taken a, yeah. Taken away by addiction, yeah. um, or rather, how I actually look at it is given <laughs> away. Yeah. Um, it it stings. I mean, it still stings today. I, I have a lot of people I'm I'm still close to in that company, and I'm very excited and happy and for them and proud of them and, and their growth and their ability to continue to do what they did. Um, me knowing that I was part of the foundation of that that got it to that point. There's pride in that for sure. Yeah. Um, recently, they uh, celebrated their 20th anniversary of the beginning of the company, and. I don't know, six or seven outlets carried it, uh, covered it, and mm-hmm. every one of them quoted me, which felt good, really? right? Sure, maybe probably drove a couple of them crazy. Um, but I, um, you know, I often felt like I'm stain on their reputation. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like, you know, my legacy there, I didn't ever expect to leave, but I felt like my legacy there was, was now something pretty ugly. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I've worked through a lot of that. Uh, when they sold, it, it definitely stung, and you know, part of me was like, well, I, "I helped build this company. I deserve some of that." Is, is anyone going to write me a check? Yeah, um, it doesn't work that way. Right, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. Um, it's a. It's a. It's to some degree, it was like it felt like a slap in the face. On the other hand, a different, you know, a reframe perspective of that. It's like it's just kind of like a splash of water. Like, hey, you you help. You help build this. That's amazing. You keep on this path. Maybe you can do that mm-hmm. again. Yeah. But this is a reminder of why the other path takes everything from you. Yeah. Or you give everything away. Um, and so it's it's yeah it's it's bittersweet for sure. Um, and it's has had a large impact on on me. Um, but again, I'm so close to a lot of people in that. Uh, I just you know I. I was more concerned about like my legacy being something really negative, and I feel yeah. like I've gotten away from that. Um, well, lucky, luckily now you've compiled enough things that you've done in the positive world where it yeah. outshines that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I truly believe that, and thank you. Um, so, yeah, I had an opportunity to open a, another restaurant um, after I'd had some some space. I wasn't sure if I was able to go back to the restaurant uh, business. It was. It was hard. There was a, some scapegoating there of like this was a lifestyle that yeah. it tore me up. But I didn't want to scapegoat the restaurant business and, and the hospitality profession because it's important to me and it's what I love. Um, so I thought, well, maybe I can go back and I can do it in a way that's a little different. And maybe I can encourage other people to do the same. Um, just modeling, right? Yep. So I stayed in my community. Uh, many people would have left, <laughs> run. You know, it's a pretty big deal in my in, 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 in my community. It's a pretty small community as it is yep. in our business. And we all, there's a lot of visibility. We all talk to each other. But I, re- I really wanted to make sure that I stayed there and kind of rebuilt me and, and, and redeemed, redeemed myself, uh, redeemed myself um, in that community. And, you know, I would be lying if I didn't say some of it was um, ego. Yeah. Right. And saying like, y'all you, you, you saw me fall publicly, like watch me rebuild right. publicly. I did. I, I just was talking about this with somebody on the podcast. And I was saying like things have happened in my life to now where everything I do, I do with a chip on my shoulder. Mm-hmm. Like I and everybody will say like, oh, you don't have anything to prove. And I don't. Right. But to me, I still do. And mm-hmm. I still feel like I have to prove it to everybody to show you I'm not that worthless piece of shit mm-hmm. that uh, I once was. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I've, you know, dug into that and and when i've dig d- deeper into that it's like it's obvious to me that i was trying to prove something when i was 16 and and dropped out of high school in the ninth grade i was trying to prove something when my mom and dad split and i didn't speak to her again for years because i didn't think that she wanted to speak to me i'm mm-hmm. like i've been trying to prove something for a long time yeah um and i um 
did a lot of things. I think a lot of my success was spite was spite fueled. Um, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. I'll show you. Like, I didn't do that path, but I'll show you. I can be successful. Yeah. Um, and that's not healthy. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's not healthy at all. That's when you get. That's when I got trapped into the addiction and this. And you know, escaping the stress of having to prove and show with drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Um, so. Again, go, going back, I go back into the restaurant, open a restaurant. Almost everyone I hired was in recovery, purposefully. Yeah. That's a fucking disaster. Because <laughs> it was all new recovery, right? Because right, I was right. new recovery. I was two years in at that point. A lot of my um, my team and staff were were a few months in, um, which was uh, incredible. Don't get me wrong, but it was a disaster. Yeah. Um, and the ones that weren't were typical restaurant cooks, which were the complete opposite. And it caused so much, mm -hmm. um, it's just tumultuous, but you know, not because anybody was, was, was ugly to each other. It was just, there were so many emotions in so many different places all the time. And just, it was just very unstable. That restaurant didn't work and I'm not blaming, that's not why it didn't work for a lot of reasons. Um, but it was, it was a, such a learning experience because when I had an opportunity to open my next restaurant, um, I understood a little bit more uh, right. uh, of how of how to do it and how to balance the teams so that there can be support and not just this like wild mix of instability and emotional mess. Right. right? Um, in the meantime, though, we had a coffee company that we started called My Name Is Joe Coffee, and when we did that, again, um, all our proceeds went to um, specifically a, a rehab center in, in Central Texas mm -hmm. uh, that we've talked about, as well as um, everyone we hired was in recovery, but right. we did it in a way where it was almost like a halfway program for for employment, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, it was like a, a, a first step to go somewhere else. And my business partner and I, who is still my business partner, uh, who's also in recovery, um, we were really proud of that and were able to raise a lot of money for, for some rehab centers in Central Texas and employ a few people and get them on their next yeah. on their next path pathway. Did, uh, all of those people are still sober. Really? Today, yeah. Holy shit, that's huge. Yeah. You got the best success rate in the country. I know, right? <laughs> Dude, that's... That, that's amazing that somebody would decided to like start stepping to the forefront of the recovery thing. Cause for years I worked in the restaurant industry cause I bounced around a lot. It was always easy for me to get a yep. waiter job and I wanted to be plugged in where the party was so mm -hmm. that that was the easiest first place. It didn't matter where, what town I was in or anything. Yep. If I can get a job in a restaurant, I'm good to go. I'm going to find everything I need, True. make friends with the back of the house. They're going to take care of me on food. Yep. I'm good to go. Um, Absolutely. But, when I when I first started learning more about you, and then you know I'd lo love to get into the the Commodore Run Club and mm -hmm. you know the the restaurant you have, it's it's amazing, dude. The the shift, the post shift, and and everything like that, like that is you're a leader, man. Like to to put that out into an industry like that, and mm -hmm. to get such a camaraderie based group, mm -hmm. and like I see those people, and I see the I see the swag all around Austin, and every <laughs> time I see it, I'm like, oh, that's my guy right there. Let's <laughs> go, like, dude, it's awesome. Like yeah. what? what pushed you started mm -hmm. i'd have to imagine i got so much out of running i just wanted to share that gift with other people mm -hmm. i would think it's a degree of that but like what what got your brain going on that and what pushed you in that direction absolutely so much of my career is based on mentorship mm -hmm. um, i learned from mentors you know my mentors learn from mentors um, it is more of that like classic trade where you learn from mentors you, you know, can you go to school yes do people who go to school have more success than people who are traditionally classically trained by mentors not usually um, it's usually the other way around that's that but it, it's 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 always mentorship it's always leadership um, when I when the, the restaurant that I was mentioning that didn't work that, that failed I, I learned a little bit about how I needed to mentor rather than how I needed to be part of what was going mm -hmm. on. Um, so moving forward, I wanted to make sure everything I did was like, why can't we mentor? I, I don't need to mentor how to be a pastry chef. I don't need to mentor how to, I mean, I still do to some degree, but why can't I mentor a healthy living in the restaurant business? Mm -hmm. like why, why can't that be the mentorship? Um, so I really started to focus on what that looks like. Why can't I be the face of recovery in restaurants in my community? Mm -hmm. um, not the only one, but can I be a face of yeah. recovery? Can I be a voice of recovery? I already have this face recognizable in my career nationally. Mm -hmm. Like I have a platform. 
this is working for me. It's working for me because I am I am better, uh, I, and I truly truly was better. Right. I, I, I get better every day. Um, so why why can't that mentorship? Why why can't that be the mentorship? You know, going back to like ego and legacy as well. I'm like this can be my legacy, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and like, it's funny how it creeps back in. Yeah, it's it's a balance all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's just it's 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 human nature. I mean, it's it's I don't think it's human nature from the beginning of time, but it's human nature today. It's societal, yeah. right? Um, so, with the Commodore Run Club and what we it, look, it didn't start. I didn't start the Run Club with this mission to do this thing, right? We started running because we needed to get outside. Mm-hmm. And me and some of the, and at the time, other chefs in our kitchen at Comodoro, as we're building it, we're like, let's go outside, let's do something, right? We're in the kitchen, no windows, 12 to 16 hours a day, which isn't how we work anymore, but we were opening a restaurant. That's, that's just what, that's what we did. Um, that's what many do. And so we go outside, get some daylight, run around the trail, or basically run from the restaurant to the trail and back. Um, and then we started putting on Instagram, hashtag Comodoro Run Club. And a few other, at the time, chefs were like, hey, you know, um, one, the main one being James Robert, who you've, you've met a few times, who's my co-captain. Uh, he's a chef owner of Fixed Restaurant, which is right down the street. He would come run with us because it like, was also pro- proximity-wise close. So as we're tagging Comodoro Run Club and people are showing interest, I'm like, well, let's, let's really do this. Let's formalize this. I connected with another runner who is a, a career um, industry um, hospitality professional who uh, Robbie Ballinger mm-hmm. and he uh, he and I spoke much about run clubs and having this hospitality based run club and so like we were talking about it and he was egging it on he came to our first official run and had many runs since and um, we uh, we made it we made it official we, we called it three days Monday Wednesday Friday 10 a.m. And we have since then, and that was July 21st, 2019, we have not missed a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Holiday, rain, snow, not much snow. Um, besides, <laughs> that, besides, that, besides that two weeks we had. COVID. Or the snowpocalypse. Right. right. Yeah, we ran. Did you really? Yeah, no, no, Let's we definitely go. ran. <laughs> yeah, we ran. Um, even through the first the first shutdowns of from the pandemic, um, we ran. And we, we, we really made sure that that we could still connect in that time because mm-hmm. we had so many. So go, uh, let me just, let me, let me backtrack for a minute. So if, around the same time, Ben's friends, which is a, a national nonprofit based in Charleston founded by uh, Mickey Bass and Steve Palmer, who are uh, lifetime uh, restaurant professionals, restaurant operators. Um, they, um, started a coalition of sober food and beverage professionals um, and a way to connect. And it was city by city. And at the time when uh, we started the Austin chapter, um, they had been in about, I think, 12 cities. It, w- it wasn't huge, but it was growing. Uh, pandemic hit, went to Zooms, it exploded. Yeah. And it exploded because people needed needed connection and yeah. community. Um, and now it's in 22 cities. It's, thousands and thousands of people who engage with Ben's friends. It is so much more well known um, and it's going to continue to grow in in in-person cities. So Austin became the, the, and Comador became the the, um, headquarters of that. So we had the Comador Run Club and Ben's friends both leaving from Comador. And on the outside, a lot of people in the restaurant business were like, in our community was like, oh, that's a sober running group. Mm -hmm. We are not. Um, And so the perception of, of that did attract a lot of people in recovery. So especially during the pandemic, it was important that we kept meeting Mm -hmm. um, and kept that connection because there are people who are craving and looking for that. And I think it truly kept people on the path they wanted to stay on. Mm -hmm. Um, Whether that was a path of sobriety, a path of health, uh, a path of not isolating, whatever it may have been. And I'm really, I'm really grateful that we were able to continue to do that and have people come in and out. Um, So going back to what I just brought up, Ben's friends, Comodo Run Club, Yes, through modeling and through mentorship, our restaurant has become a place where we have programming built into our business, whether you work there or not, where you can run with people who are wanting to do something a little bit different mm-hmm. in their in their physical fitness journey um, and in the business. You can we do yoga there once a week. That's open up to the to the, oh, no, to the public. Yeah, um, we have an amazing yoga instructor, Caitlin Campbell, who comes and hosts a 45 minute yoga for hospitality yoga. Uh, we do that in our building, which is an amazing, beautiful building. Yeah. So it's a really cool experience. Um, 
And then we have the Bench Friends that meets once a week in person. And then we have a national meeting that we host, which is on Saturdays. Uh, again, there's like two or three meetings a week every day of the week. But those are the ones that we are we are in charge of. Um, as well as we do a lot of other programming within the restaurant that focuses around not necessarily sobriety or mental health, but it focuses around the ability to connect and build camaraderie outside of the bar. Mm-hmm. Because that is, you know, we work until... 10 p.m., 11 p.m., 12 a.m., 1 a.m. There's, and we don't feel like there's a lot to do at that time. Yeah. And there really isn't, right? right. It's mainly bars. However, yeah, no, if you have some, good. You know, nothing good happens there. Right. I mean, really. Yeah. Um, if you know that you can do something in the morning, but maybe later morning, it's not a 545 run club meet that most running training groups are. It's not a training run, right? We're not out here saying come to Komodo Run Club and train for your next ultra, right? Right. We want we have a one, two, and three-mile route. It is a community run, mm-hmm. right? If we're doing Ben's Friends at 11 in the morning, cool. I can go home. I can make a different choice. Or maybe I can go to the bar and have one beer and then go home and make a different choice. Um, and then wake up at a reasonable hour and then have a way – to connect that is not the typical post shift culture. Right. So that's where the shift of post shift comes. Right. And we work in shifts, right? That's what that's that's what it's mm-hmm. in the restaurant and many other businesses they call they call them shifts. So we work in shifts. So we often have a pre shift meeting mm-hmm. and then we have the post shift hang. Shift to post shift culture. Yep. We're still hanging, but we're not doing it at that time. We can go to a reasonable hour, get some sleep, work hard, connect, do something kind of healthy. We, uh, my wife runs something called Farm School, where we have a lot of uh, restaurant professionals come out and learn how to farm mm-hmm. in the morning, um, at nine in the morning. So again, it's not an, an ungodly hour. I mean, right. nine's, nine's getting a little early for some restaurant people. Um, and um, yeah, through all of this programming and um, just opportunities to build community outside of the bar, it's really exploded into a lot of different things. And if you can do different things, if you can do running and yoga and sobriety and farming and whatever it may be, then you can hit a lot more people. It doesn't, but it did all stem from Komodo Run Club right. and us coming together and then having this like also sober professionals meeting happening in our, in our building. And to me, like as a restaurateur and an operator and an owner, but also a chef, like what better mentorship than saying, hey, you can do this different. Yeah, dude, that's that's beautiful. I've I think we've talked a little bit before. My my stepfather's grand mm-hmm. grand uh, retirement plan was he was just gonna open up a little restaurant bar and just relax and sit at the end of the bar and talk shit. And uh, mm-hmm. he found out very quickly that that was not the chill job that he expected. But yeah. so they they just sold the restaurant and it did, you know they did amazing at it. But the one major headache was being able to find people, especially now post COVID mm-hmm. that want to work. And mm-hmm. if they did, if they did come to work, anybody that was come to work is all fucked up. They're on drugs or on this and that. And they just, they can't find anybody. And specifically for us, it was the back of the house. Yep. Um, it was easier to find, you know, high school, high school guys or girls that wanted to make money, making tip money and stuff like that for waiters, but it was the back of the house. Mm-hmm. And so it took me back to when I worked in the restaurants and, there was no culture. There was no running culture. If there was, I wasn't a part of it. Right. Um, no, we we did pills and did coke when we got off work, and we all drank, and that was the that was the thing. And so, for you to tackle that on such a big industry and such a prominent industry in downtown Austin is, yeah. dude, it's beautiful and it's amazing to see what it's grown into. Thank you. I I I agree. You know, sometimes I need to step back and say that and and hear that, and, and I'm uh, definitely grateful for for you to say that and for me to be here today to share it. Um, yeah, to step back and look at it even more recently, um, hearing other people talk about it, and like it's it, it is awesome. It's awesome to know that it could stick and grow both. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I I see other run clubs around the country popping up in the restaurant space and a lot of them most of them have either reached out to me or one of us and say how do you do it or um will like tag us in a post and say like like them we're we're, we're doing this as well and like to be a model around the country of, of that that's it's so incredible too um and it's just a testament to all the people who come and are a part of it and, and commit to doing it if myself 
or any of the number of people who are the core members of Rome Club didn't show up every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the last five years, it wouldn't be. Right. Right. But we all believe that it's a it's a great way to build community and the camaraderie. You know, me leaving on a Friday to come to San Antonio during a run club day, like I know that it's gonna be a group and the group's gonna be great and in this in this case it's gonna be James that leads it and it's and everybody who's gonna go there is gonna have an amazing time and hopefully come back another time. Um, it's just a testament to the commitment to to build a community and, and stay within that community. Dude, that's yeah. That's the shit, dude. Just thinking about seeing some other, other restaurants or places uh-huh. around the country yeah. co- copying you guys, but uh-huh. it's they're it's flattering. Yeah, you know what I mean. They're they they see it making an effect, and they're doing it too. Well, when I see that, and kind of the goals moving forward, and especially for twenty twenty four, and we're very very close. We're working on our five hundred one c three. So we're currently re- recognized in the state of Texas as a nonprofit, but we're looking for that final federal um, recognition that allows us to do a lot more work and raise some funds to to hopefully really you know grow and infuse into other communities around the country so you know why can't there be a Comodo run club in every major city across yeah. the country and just have this playbook and of ways to do it to provide resources for people who want to change that narrative right like they want to change their story of how their physical health can can evolve in the restaurant business um when doing so we know your mental health evolves we are not mental health professionals right Right. so and there are many um organizations and nonprofits that kind of hit on that mental health part um in the restaurant business and, and, and and you know all over so why don't we create something that really focuses on the physical health journey because there are so many unhealthy people that work in the restaurant business and um, kind of stay in our lane and say, hey, we don't offer mental health resources, but these people do, right? We can connect those dots. And then we can say, all right, you want to run, you want to do yoga, you want to learn how to weight lift, whatever it may be. It'll be the Commodore Run Club, but it will it will be all physical health. You need to learn how to eat better. Uh, you know, I'm really, really diving into to more nutrition. I'm starting to take more nutrition classes. I understand and love and know food. Um, I understand food techniques and culture origins mm-hmm. and, and food stories and tell them and hear them and eat them. Um, but I really want to dive into nutrition Be scientifically beyond what I know yeah um, you know continuing to be able to bring together and source you know the most local most most not only sustainable and humanely raised products but also that what are best for your body yeah. um, and healthiest and why can't we take these resources and put them out all over the all over the country and basically essentially create a playbook and say, Hey, in your community, if you connect to, you know, this physical therapist who wants to go and do some pro bono work for, for a different community. And we've learned that everybody in our city wants to help. Yeah. Right. Run lab, stretch lab, like all of these, the loop running supplies been our biggest supporter. We've got recognition from Hoka and Saucony and you know we just did this huge video with Hoka this like run club spotlight and we're going to continue to do more things with Hoka because it was so successful because so many people saw well, what's happening here a restaurant hospitality based running club that is going to shift the way that they can be healthy right we love that we support that and then so many people in the physical health um and physical fitness profession that have those resources want to come and help yeah so that i'm sure that can happen all over the country so let's create through our nonprofit. we're going to create not only bring in those resources um, and create this playbook for people to be able to do that in their community and infuse all of the other businesses and into into the run club um, but also then get support from other brands um you know running shoes are expensive can yeah. you run without spending money sure are you going to grow as a runner Without spending money, probably not. Right. Yeah. Right. Because you want to start getting the gear. You want to start getting the shoes. shoes. You, you, you need know, a watch. You got to get the watch. Yep. Yep. You gotta, yeah. You got to get the hydration vest. Yep. So yep. expensive. Yep. Yep. And I have seen people who have never run a mile over the course of a year, year and a half, work into half marathons. And when I have all of the race directors in my community giving us race entries mm-hmm. because they want to support that, how much more exciting 
you know how much I, I've seen it with you. How much more exciting as a runner is it if you have a goal that you work towards and you go and you accomplish or, or or attempt that goal and like the journey leading up to that and then the actual physical manifestation of what that is. It's it's exciting. It's you're building more community. You're meeting more runners. Yep. I mean, it's it's so much fun. So that's part of it as well. Like you know, we have recovery. We have you know we have nutrition. We have. I mean, physical recovery. We have nutrition. We have race entries. We have gear, and that'll be the goal for the for the nonprofit, in which we're we're almost there, is to create all of these resources for for people. Let's go. Yeah, Dude, and then and gym memberships, right? All yeah. of that. Um, you know, we have running coaches who come in and and help do marathon plans, but again, the Komodo Run Club is not a training run, right? And so, but that's, it's, that, that's what I always thought it was. Yeah. When I, the very first time I came, I thought it was that, and I was like, oh, this is kind of different. It took me. A, second to figure out but especially now as you're talking about de developing an entire program like mm -hmm. but that 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 right there is going to impact people and, and change lives and and stuff like that yeah i love the um again like as you start pushing it as you start doing it and then you really want to like dig deeper into it but i love like bringing in other ideas um for physical fitness as well and just a health journey so i'm always open to like those ideas and connecting with other people to see what that looks like for them and then asking you know my staff or people who come through my restaurant specifically or asking other restaurant operators the same like what excites you because running doesn't excite everyone right and so it's important to figure that out as well yeah absolutely so my wife was very excited to know that you were coming on oh yeah yeah she, she's a huge i don't know what food fan fan of like she watches all the shows uh -huh. and all that stuff i don't even know i think the term is it. foodie it's kind of a dumb term i guess she's a foodie yeah, yeah but we don't go to foodie restaurants for whatever reason <laughs> um but she was so excited to have you on i'm curious why is the culture is it, are they just playing it up for the show <laughs> or what like I've, i never worked at a restaurant where there was like sh a chef chef right it was, right. It was cooks right um but why is it so militant back there? Is it just the the higher level restaurant you go to? That's it's, what it needs to be because it's on such a fine line of what it needs to taste like when it comes out, all that stuff. Or well, traditionally, or do they play it up for TV? Both, both. okay, um, especially today, and, and especially on TV because it, the, that hierarchy has has it hasn't dissolved mm -hmm. but it's lessening also and i i said this on a panel the other day i was with some other chefs when we were talking about mental and physical health in the in the restaurant business and like the evolution of the culture of the restaurants um and i had to remind them like we're in a bubble like we're in austin texas we're doing it right right like we're the we're the chefs who are like oh come to work feel good right and have you know we'll pay you a lot we're gonna pay your insurance and you can go running um it's not like that everywhere right um and I think we, we figured out a way to do it. We've worked it into our, our restaurant budget. It's important. We also are expensive restaurants. Like it, it's, it can't all work that way. Yeah. I mean, I think it can. We need to figure that out. But I, I, remind us that we are, are a little bit in a bubble. Um, there is still some of that culture that exists and some of the higher end restaurants as well. Traditionally in restaurants, um, I mean, if you think about what a restaurant is, it's a place where you go and get served, mm -hmm. right? Traditionally in restaurants, it is, there's a, a type of person that works in this restaurant in, in restaurants because it is the job, it is, it is a serving job, yeah. right? Um, it's all we do, it's hospitality, mm -hmm. but it is, it is also serving. It is, it is, it is working for an elite class. Um, traditionally in European and restaurants, you know, are uh, accredited to begin in, in, in Europe and, and traditionally in, in the European kitchens, it worked in the brigade system. The brigade system is a militant system okay. and it's that of a system of hierarchy. Um, and from the executive chef to the chef de cuisine, to the sous chef, to the, to the, to the different chefs of each station, to the commies and, and, and all the way down. Mm -hmm. And so that is the culture. It is that of, okay, if we're going to go and execute this meal for this many people in every minute for this amount of hours, there has to be a very, very specific structure to that mm -hmm. time-wise. That means that the prep has to be done at a certain time and the stations have to be at a certain t set up at a certain time. I mean, all the way down to the equipment needs to work this way. We need to have, sometimes I talk to people at restaurants, they're like, tell me what it's like to open a restaurant. I'm like, okay, cool. You have 150 seats. You have 17 dishes on your menu. You have at any times, at any time, all or half of those seats full. 
how many plates do you think you need? Not 150. You need all the plates for each of the dishes, for the dining room to be set, for mm -hmm. the kitchen to be full of plates, and for the dish pit to be full of plates. You need three times what you think you need. Those precise moments of figuring out the plateware, the seats, the, the, the dishware, what cooking equipment you need, what time everything needs to be done so it can be fired so that you can get your food in seven to 12 minutes because you're going to be grumpy because you're hungry and you're right. coming in from traffic and you're upset because you haven't eaten and you have a, uh, an experience at the host stand and then you get sad and then like, where's my food, right? It's crazy. Yeah. And Restaurants have shifted a bit. It's a it's a little more communal. It's a little more hospitable. But like, if you really think about like what nicer restaurants always were, it was that you go, you spend a whole lot of money, and you get doted on. You yeah. have this full crazy experience. There is some real class structure that needs to be recognized there, mm -hmm. and 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 understood like who works in restaurants too. It's mainly people of color, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's a whole other podcast. Yeah. However, <laughs> yeah, we we got on that, Go ahead. <laughs> right? But the the brigade system, the militant system, it, it, it's very real, um, and for a long time, very necessary. Um, but we are evolving past that. Gotcha. Um, and the evolution past that is something that is much more collaborative. Um, there's a bit more vulnerability involved in that. And there is a realization that we're all humans coming to work. And when you have a bunch of humans that feel better in the workplace, it's not as hard to find those employees because they're staying more, right? Right, And they're not leaving to just get the next job because this job doesn't matter as much because I can make a dollar across the street, a dollar more across the street or this or that. Like you're creating careers yeah. and you're creating places for people to be happy and thrive and grow. Um, and so that's the difference. It's, it's, there's definitely an ev evolution that's, that's happening. Did you, have you, did you see that movie? I want to say it came out on, uh, on HBO. Probably. You know what I'm talking about? It's the, uh, the dinner, the meal, the whatever. The menu? The menu. So what would yeah. you think? Um, so many people I know have had so many different reactions to that movie. Um, I didn't know if it was a horror story or a dark yeah. comedy or a documentary. I mean, it felt like all of the above at different points. I, I laughed and cried. Um, it, it was actually really... Um, emotionally impactful to me really? for multiple reasons. Um, some people saw that movie, other professionals that I know saw that movie and were like, that's dumb. Some people were like, oh, that was really f entertaining and funny. Yeah. And then some people, <laughs> myself included, were like, that was fucking dark and heavy. Yeah. And there's a lot of reality to the completely unrealistic situations that were happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally have experienced you know, the obviously gross fabrication of what had happened mm -hmm. in those scenarios, but pieces of that, right? Yeah. From from the uh, all, all sorts of things to, to the very, very last scene where all he wanted to make was a burger and fucking s'mores, right? That's all I really want to make at the end of the day. Um, and, and literally have done, have like created restaurants to be able to do that. Um, it's, it's wild. Um, the, the guest experiences and all of those is very relatable. The the, the critic, the the tech bro business, um, that business partner is that like guy, that guy. I forget his name. The guy that played the lead role, not the chef, but yeah, the I don't remember his name either. The guy that was on the date uh -huh. or whatever, he crushed it. Yeah, like the way he's so he was so into what the chef was saying and everything. Yeah. You could tell he was like a fan. Yeah, and each of those, each of those again, a gro again a gross elaboration of that. But each of those people exist in, right. in the restaurant all the time. Um, it's a really in in restaurants are really interesting. I thought um, it was so different. I was fat. Like I think I think largely movies are trash nowadays, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But that, that was, was one. It was so different. I was like, "This is great." Yeah. Like, uh, agreed. It, it was. It was pretty great. And the um, everyone that came together to make that movie. There's a lot of professionals involved, and um, it was it was really awesome. Uh, I did. I, I did enjoy it, and it was uh, again. It was emotionally pretty impactful to me in a way that was surprising, especially when I had heard other the way ha other people had reacted to it. Um, there's so many portrayals of restaurants whether it's TV shows or food media or social media um, or, you know, all of the rewards lists that come out, all of the now social media um, content creators that are 
pretty much have become the voice of the critic. Mm -hmm. um, all of the fiction and nonfiction, both. So not only documentaries, but also all you know, the bear that was huge. I don't know if you saw that. Oh yeah, so we started we started watching it. Yeah, I mean, proper Midwest boys. You can mm -hmm. probably connect to, connect there, and 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 like that working class of. I, I I really connected to the bear. I thought it was a great a great series. Again, I have professional friends who hated it and who loved yeah. it, and they're like I don't want to go home and watch what I do at work and be stressed out or this is completely overacted or over overdone. It's still so entertaining to yeah. me, and I and I love um, I love watching what the portrayal is at from some, from someone else's perspective because all we have is our own perspectives and we're all living our own life. So to see someone else's perspective of the life that you live is super interesting to me and often very entertaining so fun question yeah. favorite restaurant movie or show of all time go favorite restaurant movie or show yeah restaurant movie or show of all time i oh, would say oh, we can go give me your favorite movie and favorite show <laughs> um i love the big night of uh, stanley tucci it's so good is that the movie that's an old school movie I'm not familiar yeah with that one. it's super good um, mine's waiting waiting okay yeah. that's a good one a lot of a lot of funny stuff happening yeah. in there. Yeah, it's like like a Binnigan's, right? You have like all this swag yeah, on, yeah, yeah. And like yeah. Or wait, <laughs> was the no the swag was uh, Office Space. You know, no, you know what I'm thinking of? I'm thinking of Super Troopers, shenanigans. Shenanigans. Anyways, but that, that but was waiting not, was like um, was like one waiting, of those waiting. They're working at basically like an Applebee's. Yeah, or whatever, like one of those it's restaurants. Just all the raunchy stuff that happens, and it, again, uh -huh. it was played up, but not that far off. No, not that far off. Um, and especially like, again, it's evolved, right? Yeah. Like that was in the like late nineties, I think is when yeah. that movie came, came about. Um, and then favorite cooking show. Um, I would have to say, I, mean, I would have to probably say the bear. bear. Um, I think that is probably the best representation of, of what really happens in, in restaurants. I think it's pretty spot on. Um, but that's, that's not a reality show or like a game show. Like they're gamified restaurants and, yeah. and and restaurant kitchens and there's so many i mean that's how the food network became so popular know, and Bravo every, day, every and, day i come home there's one on my television yeah <laughs> um i like is this cake a lot i know that's not really a, a restaurant show but have you seen that is this cake, is this cake? Is, is it's this like it? people who make cakes that are supposed to look like real you know real life yeah so that's what objects. she was watching i think a couple of weeks ago yeah, we watched the uh, the grinch one where they were everything they did was the grinch and <laughs> all that but i know i know what you're talking about it's there's so one funny. i just found that like it looks like uh it's like they mixed food and then the uh, monster masks and props and stuff like yeah, that that's awesome um there's also one where it's like just regular like everyday household objects or objects and there's one with like jordans there's one with like video and podcasting equipment like putting your knife through a camera or a cake and like, oh and it's all food it's all food oh no shit it's 100 it's all 100 edibles oh, it's yeah. a really good it's a really well, entertaining show <laughs> what um what's your f favorite so all right, first question yeah what is your fight song you're walking out you're walking out tonight friday night you're uh -huh. gonna fight for the ufc championship what is your fight song you're walking out to oh well, I remember I just I just PR'd my half marathon on a really tough course, and as I was running up the mile ten hill, um, I looked over at the, the my my very good friend that I was running next to, and I was like, my power song's on, I'm going for it, and I did, and like that was that's how I finished the race, and that's how I uh, I ended up PRing it, um, and it was Dog Days are over Florence the Machine, um, okay. it, I don't know, something about that song really. Like gets me, gets me going. Um, I would also say Kill Jill is one of them. Okay. Um, big boy, Killer Mike. Um, uh, we'll we'll go with those two. Uh, I mean, I like I'm gonna it. have to go with. Uh, I mean, Promises, Fugazi's definitely on that list. Uh, it's hard. I'm all over the place with music and have you, been my whole. Are you a hip hop head or not? I am a head. Yes. Are you? Yeah, absolutely. Who's, who's your top five? Oh, that's the hardest question you can ask. Top you know five, what? your top five favorite. We won't even say top five best. We're okay. just gonna say top five favorite. Still a still a really difficult question. I mean, it, it changes all I of know. the time. I know, I know, I know. I mean, and am, am I going? Question. Am I going like single members of different groups? Am I going Pasta News or am I saying De La Soul? Am I going Rizzo no, or not. saying Wu Tang? Am I saying top five favorite rappers? Five, top five favorite rappers: AC Alone. Okay. 
Um, for sure. I would say Pasta Noose, for sure. Drez from Black Sheep, for sure. I would say Andre, for sure. Andre, really? Yeah. Okay. Um, How did you feel about the flute album? <laughs> did you listen to it? Yeah, of course I listened to it. Yeah, I listened to it the day it came out. Again, it, uh, we evolve, we we change. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I love what he said about it. Like, it, I, I can't rap anymore because I'm not living that life. This is my life. This is my perspective. Yeah. This is what I do now. Trying, I get that. I'm trying to think, who is um, um, J Lives on there for sure? Is that five, four? See, let's call it four. I think okay. it's five, but I'll right. call it four. I want to keep naming them because um, it's just it's it's hard. So with the Andre thing, who That's is? Five. Why am I blanking out on the rapper? Um, who was the who was the rapper that did kick push and all that? Lupe Fiasco. Yeah, Lupe. Uh-huh. Did you see Lupe came out and then freestyled over the? No, I haven't seen that yet. That's dope. That like he dope. like threw him a bone and was like, "Oh, this is dope. I'm gonna rap over it." Yeah. And so like, I did thought he throw that him was, a bone? I th- I think he was doing it to pay homage. He wasn't doing it to, because people were there were people online talking shit that it was a flute album. Yeah. And they were like, "What the fuck is this?" And so he came out and rapped over it, and so now nobody has anything to complain about. Lupe Fiasco's rap. Uh, he's a great MC. He is not in my top five, but he's 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 yeah, down, he's, he's down great. Down. He's not in my top five, yeah. but he's great. Talented. Talented human. I like you're picking you're picking people off the beaten path. You're picking like some underground like well, you're not it's picking the, mainstream shit. Well, it's just the people that that I relate to the right. most through through their music and the who I've listened to the most over the yeah. years. Um, and I could go on and on and on. I mean, I like me- making lists like top ten sophomore albums, mm-hmm. like. You know, like what? Let's really dig into the music that's being made, and and and, and so. Uh, I could do but a I whole. Have, no, I could do a whole another podcast series on just talking rap. Yeah, we time. should do that. I'll come. I'll come. I'll come to that one for Oops. sure. I mean, nope. I, I definitely have more knowledge oh, of. Do like a hip hop roundtable fucking talk. Oh, let's what, go. And what you need to do is you 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 need to get people that aren't our age. Well, I don't know how old you are. I assume Forty. Close. Yeah, we're pretty close to the same age. Um, because you know, I am very knowledgeable about a time period. Yeah, I am pretty knowledgeable about subsequent time periods. Yes, yeah. um, I don't have the perspective. I I just learned about Kendrick, right? Like right. I just learned that Childish Gambino is brilliant. Yeah, in so many ways, not uh-huh. just not just lyrically. Yeah. Um, I just learned that Kendrick Lamar is. I just said Kendrick, but I just learned that Kendrick Lamar is is one of the best MCs of the last decade, if mm-hmm. not the best. Mm-hmm. I just learned all of this. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um. Yeah. There's so much I don't know in today's hip hop because, by and large, it's garbage. Yep, yeah, I agree. Um, but we need to get people who don't agree with that, because maybe we can be introduced to more. Because it's there. That's what I'm saying. Like, granted, the non Zai name started really coming about almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, over the last five years, I don't know. I mean, J Live is incredible. I mean, excuse me, um, J Cole is incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially lately. Yeah. The shit he's been dropping lately on features. The evolution of of, of, of his. That right there, that's like that's what I'm looking for out of hip hop. You know what I mean? Seeing those moments mm-hmm. where he's doing these features and it's just he's blowing the. But in 2015 and 16, I was like, hip hop's done. Right. But these these artists were p- producing music that was that was incredible. Yeah. I just didn't know it. Yeah. Right. No, and, I, out, and I don't. And I didn't there. learn it until 10 years later. Um. Or you know, I mean, it's been a few years, but you know, seven years later. Um. Do you like Griselda? Not familiar. No. Yeah. Oh, I got some shit for you. Okay. Yeah. Please. I like. If you like the like boom back, boom bap, New York grimy, yeah, always. I got some shit for you. Okay. Oh, awesome. you don't know about him? Uh. Uh-uh. This is like my favorite thing in the world is putting people up on music. Yes. If you don't know about Griselda, you're about to be okay. Excited for the next couple months. Awesome. Because you have a whole new. I have a whole new playlist. Let's go. <laughs> Good shit. Um. All right. So who's your last? I don't think you gave me a five. I think I gave you five. Okay. I did give you five. All right. Yes. We'll go with it. We'll go with it. Yes. Yeah, mine changes. My fight song changes. My top five changes. It always changes. I mean, that fight song is coming literally coming off of my last race, which was four days ago. Right. Um, and it was the best race I've raced. So, and so I'm like, and those were, and then, and then in that moment, those were my power songs. It will be something different in a couple of weeks. I probably, I'll probably, right. if you ask me the same question, I'll be like, what was I saying? And this is this is my power song. It's my fight song. Um, I'm trying to think what my my top five right now. If I said top five favorite, I'd have to go Lloyd Banks. 
Freddie Gibbs. Okay. You got to know Freddie Gibbs, don't Freddie you? Gibbs and Lloyd Banks, yeah. He was Freddie Gibbs was big in the skate scene. Yeah. Um, big pun is up there for me. All right. His one album, Capital Punishment, solidifies him in the top five for me forever. Um, it's a classic album. And see, I don't like going with, I shouldn't have thrown anybody old school in there. Let's take Big Pun out. Okay. No disrespect. Dave East. No. You know Dave East? I don't know Dave East. Dave East is a newer newer New York guy. Benny the Butcher, newer, newer New York guy. For sure. Um, and then there's a dude named Don Tripp. I don't know Don Tripp. He's, he's a Memphis guy, but he's amazing. Yeah. He's, he's dropped an album every month this year. Oh wow! And so he's getting ready to come out with his twelve. Oh, damn! And they're all they're all good. Yeah, it's not like garbage twelve garbage albums. Right, <laughs> they're really good. So, <laughs> what? Um, I just want to throw a couple of terms out to you real quick, and you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, you down with that? Sure. All right. Kitchen. Uh, culture. Culture. Yeah. Running. Life. God. <laughs> Um, perspective. I mean, spiritual spirituality is important to me. God is an interesting word, right? Um, and so it's it, I, I stumble on that one, um, as, as you noticed, I'm sure. Um, what God means to us today, I think, is very different from um, what spirituality is as a whole, and it is. It's incredibly important and valuable in, in my day-to-day life, um, in my relationship, yeah. um, in all of my relationships, um, but it does not look like God. Yeah, I got you. Um, running. Life, still. Life. Did I say running you before? You already did. Damn, my bad. It's good. Fucked up. <laughs> um, yeah, make it like that never happened. Um, <laughs> hip-hop. Um, entertainment, life, lifestyle. um I, I was, you know, through the 90s, hip-hop coupled with skateboarding were the biggest motivators of, of my life um, for anything that was fun, um, interesting, entertaining. It was the way I connected. It was the way I built community the same way I do it today. I did it then. It's the way I connected with people. When I traveled, I always knew with with hip hop there would be people that I could connect to. There are things we could talk about, things we get hype on, excited about. Yeah. Um, it, it went beyond hip hop does, <laughs> did for me and does go beyond music. Um, hip hop encompasses so much more. Me too. Um, and in my definition, encompasses so much more. You know. Um, mostly thought of as a genre of music today it was a cultural lifestyle mm-hmm. and a, a way a way to live your life and connect with humans yep. for, for so many years and, yep. and still is for many but it's it's not really what it looks like today when you were maybe ask the average person what is hip-hop to you right did you the way you said that all was perfect because that's what it was for me and i don't think i ever knew that's what it was for me until you just put it like that but that was my common ground when i moved different places mm-hmm. like hip hop was the one common ground mm-hmm. i found the guys that knew hip hop and all of a sudden those were my boys cuz we we vibed out on the music and the lifestyle absolutely um <coughs> i can't thank you enough for your your time today dude i appreciate yeah. you making the trip the way we uh the way we like to wrap up the podcast is called the I Am Redemption podcast. Mm-hmm. If you're willing to look take a look in your camera and let the people know who uh who you are. I am Redemption. I am Philip Spear. I am resilience. Um I am power. I am life. I am a father. I am a husband. One of the best damn chefs in the world. <laughs> I'm a chef. <laughs> <laughs> um, dude, you got anything else you wanna you wanna plug or talk about? Anything you got upcoming this big? Um, to promote? I'm excited about um, well tomorrow. I'm really excited about what we're doing tomorrow. Yeah. We're gonna meet with Street Defeat, um, which is a. a a part of a group um, that's part of a rehab- rehabilitation c- center here in San Antonio. Um, the Street Defeat movement is 
movement as medicine for people experiencing homelessness. Um, Cormoran Run Club and friends um, are going to connect and um, run with the Street to Feet crew. We have some other locals. Someone, uh, some people have been on the podcast before as well. So you're coming tomorrow, but also Kenneth's going to be oh, there tomorrow, go. and Leroy and some of the Bear crew here are going to come, and they've been through the program and have worked with the program. Oh, perfect. Uh, we're going to run. I'm going to create breakfast for for the group. Really excited about that. I'm excited about more collaboration opportunities like that um, I'm planning for 2024 a relay race from Austin to San Antonio where we'll be received by some of those same people and do that to be a collaborative run um, I also want to as we're doing that run really pay attention to like the land of Texas and what it means and where it came from and what we often forget Texas is and was. Um, so there's going to be a little educational cultural component of that running from Austin to San Antonio in relay form. I'm really excited about that. Um, I've got Big Ben Ultra in four weeks. Oh shit! So that's exciting for me. Um, and then I have a whole gang of races and marathons this year that I'm excited about. I think um, my running, which has always been um, something that for me has been zen and recovery based and community building based has really taken a turn to something that's more athletic and goal oriented for 2024 so i'm gonna i'm gonna lean into that a little bit um, let's go i'm excited about that dude i'm excited for you that's yeah. amazing um i can't wait till tomorrow i'm very excited about it and just so you know anything in the future man if i can ever be of service or help with anything just say the word and i'm there awesome i will All right, I brother. You will be. love you man thank you All right.